I'm Dr. Henrietta Bowden-Jones. I'm the founder and uh, director of the National Problem Gambling Clinic in London. My name's Owen Bailey. Um, I live in Oxford and I am a service user, or ex-service user at the Gambling Clinic. Owen, thank you very much for coming here today. Um, we're very, very grateful that you could give us your time to talk about your past experiences and your problems with gambling. What I'd like to do today is to start by um, getting you to tell us a little bit about the early experiences. What we find is that uh, often people started being exposed to gambling early on in their lives and we're very interested in hearing your experiences. Yeah, let me give you some background context. Um, my dad split from my mum before I was born and so I was born into a single parent family. My mum, in my opinion, was um, you know, emotionally ill-equipped and financially ill-equipped to, to, to really bring me up. She, she, she helped me when, I was really, when she was really young. Um, so straight away, um, the home's, home life wasn't particularly great. It was, in, it was almost impoverished straight away. And because of my mum having her problems, um, it resulted in me going into care a couple of times when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, at the age of six, when I moved out of care, ba moved back in with my mother. Um, and she, by this time, had found a partner who eventually became quite abusive uh, emotionally. Um, and this, this created a very tense, very, very cold um, home life yes. for me. Um, it's very uncomfortable. Um, was he abusive towards your mother and I believe you, so. I was certain, certainly on, a, on an emotional level. Yeah. Um, yeah whether on a, on a physical level or mm. beyond that, I'm not too sure. Um, so this had an impact upon my confidence, my self-esteem. I didn't like myself very much. I began to get reckless, careless. I didn't care. Um, I, I was bullied as a child. I had a very low, low self-esteem and everything like that. Um, I felt isolated, very different, very mm. alone. Yeah, I wanted to fit in, but I couldn't. I, I struggled to fit in. Yeah. And so what I would find was, you know, I'd find myself being really disruptive and naughty as a child. Um, one, because I wanted the attention, and, and secondly, I, I, just, I just wanted some recognition. Of course, um, I, I understand that. And can I take you back to the, when you said you, um, you had some time uh, away from your, from your mother when you were little. What, what ages? Was that, was that for a year at a time or six months at a time? I, if I recall correctly, my first time in Best Bike Care, I believe, was for a few months yeah. with my auntie. I don't really understand the circumstances as to why I was, but I think it's mm -hmm. partly due to m my mum not being able to cope very well. Yeah. And the second time round was for a year. Um, I was taken totally away from the family unit, the family difficult. environment. Yeah. Um, and I found that quite difficult, yeah. Of course. And did your, uh, when you went back into the family home um, uh, and you were at school, was your mother working at the time? I believe she was fleeting in and out of jobs. I remember her doing a lot of bar work. She was a barmaid and a cleaner. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember, I recall her working in a number of pubs over the years I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I guess it was this experience of being with my mother when she was working in pubs um, where I first had my exposure to fruit machines. And I always recall wanting to play on them. You know, they, they fascinated me from, from when I first saw them. I always wanted to play them. But of course, I never had the money, so I was, I was not allowed to play them, essentially. Mm -hmm. Some people say that the machines attracted them when they were little because of the noise and the colours, and it was uh, a joyful uh, experience to be near the machines, particularly when they had difficult home backgrounds, being in arcades or, 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 in, or later on in pubs, yeah. would, uh, would be very attractive. I suppose it might have been a way of escaping from their troubles. Did you have anything like this? Yes. Um, I not, not only did I look upon um, gambling as a means to es escape, but I also, I also later on in my early teens, about 12, 13, I always also looked upon drinking and mm -hmm. drugs uh, and petty thieving uh, as, yeah. a, as a means to escape. Mm -hmm. I found all of that really exciting. Mm -hmm. You know, it was. Uh, and to be imb to embroil myself in all that was far better than than living and having to deal with my actual true reality. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, You've talked in the past about the stage being set yes. for you to develop problems. 
Uh, were you referring to your early, let's call them, slightly adverse conditions in terms of being raised in an emotionally difficult environment? Or yeah, I believe, I believe my early formative years were, were unhappy times and therefore I did always look at other things to, to um, help me deal with them unhappy times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you first come across bookmakers? Yeah, this, this leads me on to my first experience. When, when I first met my dad, I was 14 years old. And um, obviously, I had not met him up to this point. And this, for me, was a really, really special occasion. And he happened to come and visit me after I'd got in touch with him for the first time on Grand National Day. Um, and unbeknown to me at the time, he was a problem gambler himself. And he was also um, a horse trainer for some um, trainers as well. And it, I remember him placing a bet on this specific Grand National race. And I, I can't remember if the horse won or got placed, but I got a return um, on, well, my dad placed a bet for me and I got a return on that. And so this was my first introduction to horse form. Uh, and so this kind of like created a spark in me. You know? And I'm thinking, well, perhaps I can look at learning form and perhaps I can earn money from learning form and betting on horses. Okay. Yeah. So, so what you're telling us is something that we have come across very often. People uh, at our clinic receiving treatment often report being introduced to gambling by a parent who was either a gambler or a problem gambler or by grandparents who were, uh, again, gamblers or problem gamblers, trying to share something emotionally good with a child without realizing that they were in some way sowing the seeds for a future, a future problem. I want to ask you now something about your uh, attitude to money. You talked in the past when we discussed this about growing up in a household in which you felt there wasn't enough money. How do you think this impacted on your future troubles? Massively. Um, so I guess from the point when I moved out of care, I was living in the village and it felt like that most of my friends who, who I have met were, they felt like they had a stronger family unit than myself and it, materialistically they seemed better off. And I wanted that. Um, a good friend of mine was, was quite wealthy and I, 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 I envied um, their, their lifestyle and what they had. And they all seemed to be provided for, whereas I always felt this constant lacking in my yeah. life. Uh, and so, I, I don't know if obsessed is a strong word, but I had this fixation with wanting money. Yeah. Um, and I began to see gambling, whether it be on the machines or, or in the bookmakers, as a means to earning money quickly, yes. rather than find work and work hard and save hard. At 18, you moved to Leamington Spa and uh, in an attempt to re rebuild the relationship with your father yeah. or build it from the beginning because you hadn't sort of grown up with him, yeah. you spent time drinking and gambling with him, am I, I right? Did. that's correct, yeah. Do yeah. you want to tell us a bit more about it? Yeah. Um, when I moved to Leamington Spa, I think I was 18. At this point, I didn't really realise the impact my drinking and gambling was having upon me as a person. I was still quite ignorant, naive. Um, in denial of the extent of the impact my drinking and gambling was having on me. And in my attempt to build a relationship with my dad, my dad which I so wanted to do, I, I did drink with him and I did gamble with him. I went to a casino f a few times and this was my first experience of actually going to a casino, was with my dad. Um, this was where I was in, I discovered roulette and, and blackjack, all the typical casino games. And I was immediately turned on by the casino environment because I'm thinking, well, this is, this is something, this is a place where I can make some serious, serious money. Mm -hmm. um, Did you find it a glitzy environment? Was it uh, in keeping with your aspirations of ending up like one of the businessmen you talk about having admired there? Without any doubt. When I actually saw um, cashiers handing over pink blocks with £25,000 on them, when I saw men in suits at the roulette table with stacks of £50, crisp £50 notes and a stack of £100 chips, you know, I wanted that. Yeah, that's, yeah. There was a Sunday before Christmas when you had uh, what we call an early big win. 
Now, as you know, because we've discussed this before, some of our patients have experienced these early big wins, and they are considered in the world of neuroscience to be one of the predisposing factors to developing long-term problems with gambling. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that experience? Well, my personal view on significant wins is that, you know, I find them, I think they are very destructive in the long run. This, this particular episode was, um, I went into my, 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 my cas the casino I used to frequent in Birmingham, and I recall explicitly on this particular night, I went in with £200, and I pl went on to play on a roulette table, and I remember walking away from that table with a couple of thousand pounds, and I continued playing on another roulette table, and the whole experience was very, very surreal. I carried on playing, and, and in the end, I was, I was betting anywhere between 300 and 500 pounds per single spin, because um, I, I had that money power, and I was concentrating my efforts on, on a particular number, and I was winning and losing, winning and losing, and, and um, eventually my number came in, came in, and I won. I walked out of the casino with over five and a half thousand pounds, and for a person who would grew up impoverished and lacking money, I'd, to be able to do that, that was a very, very powerful yes. experience. Yes. I felt instantly powerful, and I've never mm -hmm. experienced anything like that before. I had options for the first time. So I suppose what, it, what this gave you, it yeah. gave you a sense of freedom. Massively. And yeah. what did you do with that freedom, Owen? What, what happened next? Well, it was Christmas. I had a fantastic Christmas because I had the money to, mm. to, to be free with it. Um, however, the, what happened afterwards was when the new year um, began and I got back into the routine of the work, I became totally obsessed with going back to the casino and winning money, re trying to recapture that experience I had previously, previously, previously before Christmas. I remember putting um, some of my money in the bank to keep it safe. And I remember this particular week whereby uh, I'd go to work and I'd be clock watching and I just could not wait to finish work, go to the bank, withdraw the cash, go to the casino and start gambling. Um, and I did that particular day. I lost a thousand pounds. And the following day I'd repeated exactly the same thing. Uh, and only this time at the casino I managed to recoup the, the, um, the previous day's losses. So um, I, was, I was back up to where I was the previous day before. The um, thing was, I was gambling with all the money I had this time, and I cashed up my money, and before I went out, I, I caught sight of the roulette table again, and within half an hour, I lost all of my money. Mm -hmm. And so I pretty much just lost everything I had. I just, yeah. Did you then, was that the point when you decided to go travelling? It was. Um, after feeling very, very numb, um, walking out of that casino, I just... I, couldn't feel. I was so, so numb. And this had an effect on my work. Not just this episode, but things, episode experiences that lead up to yeah. this period. Um, I felt very depressed, very upset, angry. Um, I just wanted to, to do something different. I wasn't happy in my work. My relationships had begun to deteriorate because I was, because I'd um, begun to get aggressive. I wasn't turning up for work. Um, I, was, I was just very unhappy. Um, and so I decided, you know, uh, um, to go to Europe and find work in Europe. This was early on in the year. So I handed in my notice and I worked my notice and saved up a bit of money. And I, I booked a boat, a ferry trip from the Hook up, from Harwich to Hook Up Island. And um, I had about a thousand pounds with me, converted that into euros, of course. And um, on the way there, I started playing roulette on the table, in, on the actual boat. And I ended up in the Hook of Holland with 60 euros. So here I am in a situation where I've quit my home, I've quit my, my job, um, I've taken all the money I have, um, and I've ended up homeless in a foreign country with 60 euros. What did you do next? How did you save yourself? It was, um, I spent a couple of days in Holland, and, and I went to Amsterdam, and, in the, and after a few days I'm thinking, this is just not, this is, this is just not gonna happen. I need to get back to England. I spent a day in the British Embassy or the British Consulate and I talked to them about my situation and they managed to give me some money to get back to England. And here I was on the bus, I was faced with the prospect of being homeless in London, street homeless in London. Um, and I didn't fancy that prospect, so what I did is um, I got off of Canterbury where the bus first stopped up in England. So it was a random decision it taken was, on the 
spur of the moment, you didn't want to be in London, so you became homeless in Canterbury instead. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How long were you homeless for? Periodically, um, I've been homeless for a number of years from, from that point onwards up until about 26 years old. I've, during that, them periods of homelessness, I've spent time in homeless hostels and homeless shelters. Yes. So, uh, what were you doing during that period? Uh, were you selling big issue magazines? What were you doing? That to period when I first arrived in Canterbury was the beginning of probably one of my lowest points. I was street homeless. I was very, very, very miserable, very sad, depressed. I don't know what words to describe, but I was not in a good um, headspace at all. Um, I began street drinking. I. Because I was homeless, I was exposed to a lot of people who had um, heroin problems, were criminally active, were very desperate people, um, people with a, a variety of mental health yeah. problems, um, people who had drink, drink, drink dependency. And so I started drinking with those. Um, it was my escape. It yes. enabled me to not think about the situation I put myself in, basically. Um, and I quickly developed an alcohol dependence. And it wasn't too long before I would wake up physically rattling, physically shaking, physically mm -hmm. needing a drink. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember uh, I, I would be drunk by 11 o'clock and my drinking obviously had a real big impact upon the way I behaved because I, I got thrown out of the homeless shelter. I was always in and out of trouble with the police for, for doing various misdemeanours, mainly shoplifting, you know, shoplifting beer and, yeah. and food and so on and so forth. Um, what made you seek treatment at the point you did? Presumably a, a roughly seven years after you first became homeless? Well, uh, well first... Access treatment, community-based treatment, um, soon after I developed a drinking problem, mm -hmm. um, I accessed um, Mount Zin, which is an alcohol service, essentially, um, where I, I began to see a therapist, and there was group sessions there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but after seven years of trying and failing to get into recovery, um, having come to the realisation that, yes, I've got a drinking problem, and that, yes, I have got a gambling problem as well, um, after seven years of being in Canterbury and still being in a similar situation, if not a worse situation than when I first arrived in Canterbury, I thought, you know, this is something has to be done here. So I considered treatment. So I spoke to my therapist at the time and we start, started the ball rolling. Uh, and uh, from the point I asked to go to rehab to the point where, I've been, where I was accepted into rehab was about four months, which is a relatively quick mm -hmm. amount of time. Um, I decided to go to the Lee community in Oxfordshire um, and this decision to go to rehab was probably one of the best decisions I'd ever made. I needed to, put, I needed to be taken out of a real-life situation and put into a, a bubble like, like rehab provided me, so I can just concentrate on myself. Um, can I take you back then to the stage before you successfully received help, when you were still um, uh, in Canterbury, you managed to stop drinking and your gambling deteriorated due to um, a change in circumstances in terms of your gambling activities. Yes. What, 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 what was yeah. happening at that time for you? Yeah. Once I managed to um, abstain from alcohol, um, I was in a situation where I couldn't work, so I was on the seat of state benefits. And I, as there was no casinos, in the local area, I, I began to go to bookmakers more often, not to um, play or place bets on the horses, but to play on the fixed odd betting terminals, um, which have casino game content on them. Um, and I found myself routinely going into the bookmakers every time I would get my welfare benefits. Um, and and I would sometimes I would win. Sometimes by 11 o'clock I'd probably have no money. But the problem with this was was that. Um, I'll be spending all my money, which I couldn't afford to spend. How long has it been since you last gambled, if you don't mind me asking? Almost 10 months. Um, and this for me, you know, being 10 months um, gambling free in the real world as opposed to being in a residential treatment setting, you know, is, is one of my biggest ever achievements I've ever, ever made in my life. Uh, the first ever treatment for problem gambling you received? Yeah, for 20 months in total. Mm. Um, a long time, but I needed that amount of time. And yeah, I believe it's helped me to become who I am today. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, however, when in the later stages of residential treatment, um, and people are 
encouraged to look for work, they secure work, and they become financially independent from the community. Um, but they still have to conform and abide by the community's rules. Um, and I started gambling when I was um, in the late stages of the treatment there. Was that because money was given to you via your work, so you were financially independent again for the first time in a while? Partly the reason, yeah, partly the reason. Um, I hadn't gambled for about 18 months by this point, and I guess I've been in this bubble, and I guess um, there's probably a part of me that wanted to try it out, but it, it, it was with disastrous results, you know, because my, my gambling um, lasted for, I can't remember how long, it lasted for a good few months, and mm. in that time, I did almost bring myself to a situation again where I was facing homelessness and... Um, yes. As, uh, as you know, one of the things that we are very careful to do when people come and ask for help is to make sure that they hand over the finances, uh, especially at the beginning of treatment. Yes. Because it is so easy either to relapse or to continue gambling. For anyone to um, abstain from gambling, I believe that is to be one of the most critical things a person has to do. Yeah. On top of um, self-exclusion and, and other things. You know. Yes. Absolutely. At your low point, uh, did you ever experience thoughts of life not being worth living? I had thoughts of suicide ideation, certainly. Um, only in moments when the, well, the, when things really, really went bad, absolutely. Um, I have not gone beyond, I have not actually acted upon suicide ideation, but mm -hmm. I've certainly experienced it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So there was a moment near your 30th birthday when you after all the suffering you'd been through, decided that you needed to change your life completely. You looked ahead 10 years and you thought, this is where I want to be in 10 years time. So what did you do then? I remember that day so clearly when I made that decision. Um, I was, like you just said, I projected 10 years ahead and I was thinking, you know, with all the information I've got, having spent all of my 20s trying to deal with my addiction, trying to get into recovery and trying to rebuild my life away from my vices, I'm thinking if, if I don't begin to apply and do what I know what I need to do, then I'm easily going to spend the next 10 years um, gambling, drinking and in trouble. And perhaps the realisation that I'd end up in a far worse situation, i.e. being in prison, um, a mental health hospital or even worse, dead, you know, was, was very, very real. So yeah, I was motivated to um, highly motivated to make those changes and I was driven, motivated to not allow my thirties be a repeat of my entire twenties. And I had this real big part of me that wanted to um, turn around, once I got into recovery, uh, I wanted to turn around all my experience to hopefully help others. Um, and deep down I wanted a better quality of life. I knew that by gambling and drinking I was never going to achieve that better quality of life. Um, I was only going to achieve a life of misery, um, and I always wanted to have good relationships in my life. I wanted, a, I want a career, I want to, I want to live life, you know. Um, so, f on all that basis, I decided to just, just do it. Hence, why um, I, um, well, it's a funny story because I, I went to see my dad, um, and I had a chat with him, and. When speaking to my dad, I realised that he had um, gone through your clinic too. Yes. And, and so I was thinking, ah, well, this is something new. This is yeah. something different. So let, let's let's start the process. Yeah. So um, I made. So your father introduced you to gambling, and then introduced you to the National Problem That's Gambling right. Clinic. Yeah. So there is some sort of order in the story, yeah. and some beauty in it as well. I yeah. think. Yeah. My. My experience with the clinic um, has been fascinating. I've got a lot of gratitude for the place. Um, and I believe the, the approach, the CBT approach, the group approach, has certainly worked for me. I remember going through the application process, the referral process, and um, it's happened quite quickly. And I was fortunate enough to um, get onto the eight-week CBT course you, you offer um, clients and service users. Um, and I have to admit that during my time um, going through the eight-week CBT course, group, group course, I was gambling. But for somehow, what I learned stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And whether on a conscious level or on a subconscious level, I've always found myself um, applying what I think I learned to, um, from the course to my yes. life. And I believe it's that experience that really has propelled me 
um, into recovery and where I am today. It's wonderful to hear that, Owen. So the cognitive behavioral therapy, the eight group, eight a session group process you went through, was that the only thing uh, we offered you at the time, or did you also take did you take up any of the family therapy work or the money management we offered? I was interested in looking at the money management side of things. Um, I didn't follow that up. Um, I didn't need to go through the family side of things. Um, there mm. was one to, the offer of one to one work, but I felt that um, that was not needed at the time. Yes. Yes. Um, um, <coughs> well, having been through this incredibly long and painful journey and having come out uh, as well as you are now actually 10 months clean from gambling do you have any advice for people who may be watching this interview today and who may be experiencing problems or wondering whether they may need help yes um, I'm just trying to think back to when I first started dealing with my gambling and I realised how ashamed and how guilty and how remorseful I felt and how difficult that was to become to come clean and become open with my gambling and so my advice to anyone would be to find the strength, find the courage to, to tell at least one person just to get it out there in the open because the reality is that I personally saw no reason to feel ashamed or guilty or remorseful to the extent um, people do. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because Problem gambling is known as the hidden addiction. Yeah. And the reason for that is just that people find it very hard to share their addiction with others. Mm. Owen, oh, some of our patients at the clinic report that once abstinent, they have to avoid the streets on which they used to go to bookmakers mm -hmm. or their favorite casinos. How do you feel when you walk past a gambling venue? Today, the truth be said, um, I feel no urge, no craving, no temptation to gamble at all. But that's, that's where I am today in my recovery. Um, and I feel strong enough to um, walk down the high street or walk, past, walk through Leicester Square. Um, and I'm confident that I won't experience any urges. However, you know, for the past 10 years, up to the point where, even, even up until about, say, five or six months ago, um, I had to avoid places um, as much as I possibly could mm -hmm. to, to, so um, I can avoid putting myself in a situation where I am tempted to gamble. I remember a time when I could not go to London without gambling. Um, I would always go to London with good intentions, but I always went to London and at some point I would have always gambled. Mm -hmm. um, but that is not the case today. Some people say that the work we do at the clinic in the sessions teaching them how to find alternative behaviors that are fulfilling to them personally in order to replace the gambling behavior with positive behaviors yeah. has helped them to yeah. stay away from uh, gambling would you say that your work helping problem gamblers learn about the illness and teaching them how to stay away from the problems is fulfilling that role for you personally? Hugely. Um, I now have successfully filled my life with so many interesting interests and hobbies and things to do. I no longer feel bored and my life today is far more exciting today than the kind of excitement I try to achieve whilst gambling um, and so I've got no, I've now lost all that wish and that desire to return to gambling. Thank you. The average current debt at presented, people present with at the clinic is about £15,000 and the average amount lost by our patients at the clinic is £150,000 and this as you can imagine uh, has tremendous negative impact on their uh, vision of the future and the ability to, to get well. Uh, do you have any current significant debts that impact on your life? No, I've been blessed in this respect. Not to say that I've not experienced debt, because I have experienced debt, but the experience I've had pretty much um, scared me so much. I thought, you know, this is the situation I don't want to relive again. And so I managed to deal with it quite quickly. Um, and I make an effort not to put myself in a situation where I can get into debt ever again. And I say I'm blessed because I hear a lot of stories today whereby gamblers um, are taking out payday loans and, and pawnbroking yes. and everything like that. 
and and that, those stories are so prevalent today. But I guess my situation, being homeless and having no credit, you know, I was not in the situation where I could take out payday loans. Yes. Um, I had one experience where I took out a credit card, um, and that did go on um, one spree of internet gambling, um, and that did cause me a lot of stress and a lot of worry. Mm -hmm. uh, and this this was in, in the months leading up to me going to rehab. Yes. Um, and fortunately, I did manage to deal with it, and. Um, it did, it did, at the time, create a lot of psychological stress, absolutely. It really did cripple me. Would you like to tell us a bit about the treatment you received at the National Problem Gambling Clinic? Yeah, it's simply, um, I initially had um, an induction um, and an invitation to go and um, attend the group sessions, the CBT-based group sessions. And basically, all it was is I would turn up on a Thursday evening and there'll be a number of um, um, people um, who will join me in a group context. And I believe it'll be facilitated by one of your colleagues. Um, and we, each week would, we would discuss a specific issue. I mean, for instance, I think, if I recall, the first session was discuss, discussing how we can um, manage the queues or reduce any temptation or any opportunity to gamble and how we'd go about doing that. Um, and another session, as I recall, would be on how to manage urges and cravings. Um, another um, focus, subject focus would be on um, filling our time with interesting stuff to do and so on and so forth. So each, each session was um, focused on a specific topic. I have decided to commit myself to do my little bit to help raise a profile of problem gambling. How am I doing that? I'm doing that in a multitude of ways at the moment. Um, one of the ways I'm doing that is I'm, I'm using the local media um, to, um, to share my story, as I'm, I'm doing today. Um, and so far, I've, I've had an article appear in the local new newspaper. I've appeared on BBC Radio Oxford a couple of times. Um, I mean, I've got, I'm building relationships up with local organisations. Uh, but there are always, always people who... Um who use the media as, ways of, as a way of getting into, into treatment. And I do believe that there is potential for doing much more with TV because there are plenty of people who are not reading the newspapers, which is where we normally end up speaking and being interviewed, who um, would really benefit if we were to do some campaign there. Yeah. Talking about illegal acts, uh, we know from research at the clinic that 84% of the people we treat have committed illegal acts at some point during their lives. This could be stealing a relative's credit card to gamble online or stealing people's jewelry to sell and use the money for gambling or defrauding their company. Do you think that the pressure that the cravings create uh, is uh, powerful enough to to cause this? Definitely, yes, one hundred percent. For me, in my situation, when I was in my teenage years, having had the experience I had gone through um, by, by committing various dishonest acts and eventually spending a small amount of time in prison for for those um, legal things I did um, during my t during my time when I was in Canterbury and gambling, I became fearful of losing my liberty in the sense of getting arrested and spending some time in jail. Um, so I kind of like did have some kind of moral codes in place, but what I did find myself doing was because I had the need to survive, um, and the only ways I could survive um, was doing a bit of shoplifting to get food. Um, I also, through my experience being homeless, I resorted to checking telephone boxes routinely um, mm. and um, car parking meters and shopping trolleys. Um, for money to gamble or money to buy sandwiches? I was starving. Um, yeah. And so it would purely be a case of finding money so I can buy myself some milk, so I can have some milk with my wheat bix or baked beans and bread. Yeah. Owen, I want to thank you and congratulate you on the work you have done up to now and on all the help you are giving people who suffer from problem gambling issues by being here and being so open about your story with all of us. So thank you thank again. You.